presenting today a project um, that Anne, uh, um, as Anne pointed out, we ran at the end of 2018 with, uh, as part of Design for the City with the Valletta 2018 and the Valletta Design Cluster. It was the project that we ran uh, with a, at AP, at AP Valletta, with uh, We Live Here, and also with the participation of Berlin-based Invisible Playground, and uh, as uh, um, in collaboration also with the local council of the of the town or village of Sigiri in Malta. The project started really as an with an approach from Valletta Design Cluster, but also from from uh, the village from the village from the mayor who were looking at. Uh, um, their new, their, the main square of the village and, and trying to understand how to consider the redesign of that and effectively today that is a, effectively a large, a very large uh, square meterage of tarmac. I, I'll go briefly through the, the sort of the roots of the, of the themes or the ideas behind the project and then I'll, I'll, I'll show you some, some images of how that's, how that panned out. I, I like to start with this because it's perhaps the first real publication um, that discusses the urban situation in Malta and uh, the way that this was evolving. Um, uh, it's a 1969 copy of the of the Architecture Review, uh, um, which was dedicated to to uh, the development of. It had a whole section de dedicated to the development of Malta, um, which was at the time curated by Quentin Hughes, who was uh, who was dean of the faculty for the built environment here, and that spoke very clearly about the need to to question very carefully the type of development that we were undertaking. Um, and uh, the way that uh, that this was um, the, the kind of effects that this was having and also there was a specific reference as well to this this approach where the, the car was really being cut the whole uh, centers of villages were being cut up to take the car right into the heart of, of what were previously spaces that were dominated by pedestrians. And fast forward 40 odd years, and we took inspiration from this at the time with the Chamber of Architects, when we drew up a position paper called the Urban Challenge, where we were uh, again highlighting pretty similar issues in as far as uh, the importance of the relationship between the built environment and quality of life, and how development also needs to support uh, quality of life. Yeah. Um, and many of the issues raised here in terms of, uh, or raised in 1969 about the car, were more and more pressing, of course, in 2007. Um, and these are just some quite roughly drawn up statistics, but you can see how in the space of 65 years, uh, vehicle ownership in Malta has literally uh, um, pretty much outgrown uh, population growth. Um, it's a very particular trend towards development. Um, which is very development centered and very car centered um, as you can see also from the growth in land cover um, which i guess is also symptomatic of, of societies that grow in wealth and evolve um, but you really have this situation where if you look here for example on the left and the right you see two two images um, which are maybe 50 years apart uh, of, of one of the Maltese villages and you see the way that development has spread and the way that the car is really cut into the heart of towns and the way that it dominates completely the, the built environment. Um, so the, the treatment of the car is really this, this Trojan horse that we pulled into the heart of cities, but has really taken public space over in a quite dramatic way in, in the Maltese built environment. And um, today there's, there's barely space for pedestrians, but, but there are cars everywhere. Recently, we, we had a situation where for years we said we had no space for, uh, for uh, bicycle lanes, for example, on our main infrastructure. But in the space of six months, we widened all our arterial network to take a third lane um, because the car is king very much in that sense. Um, and of course, this has an impact on, uh, again, more statistics in this respect, um, which are really showing the impact of, of the car culture. Um, but of course, if we look at demographics, we realize that not everybody drives and uh, there is a significant proportion of the population that doesn't. Um, and of course, usually they are the ones who are also most vulnerable because they are, they either don't have the possibility to do so or they don't have access to, to, to a car. Um, and they're usually people at the, the opposite ends of the, of the demographic spectrum and therefore the ones who are also most dependent on others. So the elderly and especially children. Um, and so in Play Space, we decided to really work with children to, to introduce, I think, this notion of, of public spaces 
something other than the space for the car. Um, but if you if you look at you look at the importance of um, of uh, chi children's independent mobility, you really understand how in a society where where the car is king, um, public space really has a value that is that is being completely neglected in this sense, and that we really are taking children as road users very much for granted. Um, so uh, um, yeah, I think it's. It's, there's no doubt that uh, that the independent mobility of children is intrinsic to their to their development, um, to their sense of autonomy, so to their own sense of growth, uh, of being independent, which is also important therefore to quality of life on a number of levels, on a mental health level, on a health and, well, for example, an obesity level. We are one of the countries with one of the highest child obesity rates, for example, in in the world. So. Um, there are a lot of a lot of values in in considering the way that the public space can be used by kids, and of course the habits that we form in childhood have a long term effect on the way that we we act as adults, and in that sense that's also very important. Um, and yeah, these are some some diagrams that really explain the the dynamic of uh, of well being, the well being dynamics, and how uh, mastery of our own environment and a sense of autonomy are really important to that. To our psychological well-being and therefore of course to the psychological well-being of children um, intriguingly also had a, a student a couple of years ago who did a similar study on the elderly and found that the built environment in this sense and the nature of car culture was really undermining their their own independence and of course their autonomy their their ability to build relationships and so on or maintain relationships and so on um, yeah and of course this is not something that's unique to us we know that uh, and we always, uh, coming from a small country, you kind of think of uh, of yourself as the center of the world, and that uh, everything in Malta is unique. And you know, of course, that that's not the case. That um, that uh, child mobility, of course, is an issue in other countries, um, um, and that parents have a concern about safety, which is growing um, not not only here but in in several other places. Um, so yeah, um, in that sense. Uh, um, I think there is a kind of discrimination in terms of the way we look at the built environment um, towards children in the sense that they are really disregarded by, by policy making and uh, um, not given due, due consideration. Um, okay, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump this and uh, go to the next bit and talk a little bit about the project. So uh, as I said, we were approached by the local council of Sijiu, which is a small town of probably a population of about 10,000 uh, the, on the west of Malta. Um, and we had this idea early on to work with children because uh, I guess the, the driver being primarily that if you want to change a culture, then in some ways you have to start by educating the young. Um, and the intriguing thing was that the CGV local council actually had a local council for children. So uh, they brought in kids of the, in the seven to 12 or nine to 12, I think, age range and sort of got them involved in the running of the village and uh, got them involved in expressing their concerns about, about uh, the way the, the life in the village. And uh, we engaged with the kids straight on in, in the making of, of the workshop and in the making of the game. And we got them to consider uh, working with a visible playground. We got them to consider how they look at public space and how they look at, at uh, private space and therefore what notions of public space they had. Um, and we got them involved straight away in the development of the game, which we actually use in the workshop. So they, a lot of the ideas about um, aspects of the game came eventually from them. Um, we did some testing, as I said, with Invisible Playground before, and we drew very much uh, on, uh, on a game that they have where they use two sets of cards, um, one, uh, one involving uh, activities and one involving places. And we developed on this with the kids and got the kids to the children from the local council to give us their own ideas of activities that they would imagine participating in in the public realm um, and drew up two sets of cards for this for this project which you can see there in the in the image on the left hand side and um, so we took over the square for a morning um, and each group of kids there were like six or seven kids in each group in the age range of about seven to twelve um, we're given a, two sets of cards, one with a group of activities and one with a group of imaginary places. And they were asked, first of all, to negotiate amongst themselves. So they reached to took one card from the pile um, 
and they were asked to negotiate amongst themselves what they would build together as a group. So there was already this element of negotiation in the public realm where you negotiate your ideas with others and try to interact and decide amongst yourselves what you would actually decide to do. And then they were given a kit, a very simple cardboard kit, which is light and transportable in this sense and reusable, um, with which they were allowed to, they were invited to, to build um, this imaginary, imaginary place for this imaginary activity in the square. And these are some of the results of that. This is the part of the square of the, of the village. Um, um, okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, there's a funny guy with the arrow there explaining the rules to the kids. Um, and this is some of the stuff that the kids built, and I think it really allowed them to, uh, the, the, the idea was very much to get them to consider this notion that public space can be something other than a place for the car. So there is an alternative. And to use, we actually assigned at the beginning, each group was assigned to one car parking slot. Um, and so they all worked initially, and then eventually, of course, it spreads out and became a bit more unruly, but initially within uh, a parking slot each. So they actually were assigned the space that is usually taken up by a car. And they come up, came up with a variety of designs. And apart from the fact that I think they had fun, which is great. And um, of course, they brought their parents and their grandparents along. So there was a, an engagement in a form of discussion here. Um, and... Uh, in that sense, uh, the beginning of a, of a questioning of, of uh, you know, what, what is the public realm and what can it be used for other than as a space for cars. And yeah, these are some of their, the contraptions that, that they devised. And yeah, some, some rather proud, uh, proud builders this morning. Um, so yeah, there you see them holding up the cards of what they've actually built. <laughs> So ro robotic palaces and uh, and fairy castles and and who knows what else. Um, okay, and then the, the last intervention we made was we asked each of them to stencil the name of the game on a car parking space. So in this sense, leaving a, a sort of memory of the event and of the activity, but also to some extent um, appropriating that space, um, at least for that day, showing that they've appropriated that space for that morning. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, two things particularly struck me in, in, in discussing these things with the kids. One was a six year old boy who, before almost starting the game, like had put eight pieces of cardboard together and told me, I'm building a six story block of flats. And then at the same time, also said, I'm making the War of Slima, which is a town in Malta which experienced a lot of construction activity. Um, and it was really this perception already of a child so young that construction <laughs> is such a key aspect of, of reality, I suppose. Um, and the real estate is such a key aspect of reality. And almost that's what he was doing more than playing. He was already building um, in a serious way. The other one was a comment that I had afterwards. There was a discussion afterwards within the council offices itself about what to do with the square. And a resident on the square came up, came up and said, look, I'm not a racist, but you know, what will happen here if we create public spaces? Uh, black people, in inverted commas, not, not very apologetically, will come and use free Wi-Fi and I won't feel safe to go out. And I was like, oh, well, I, I said, you know, I, I'll let this pass at first and then I'll speak to him again quietly after, after, afterwards. <laughs> um, and I said, well, have you ever spoken to any of these black people? Like, why are you afraid of them? And of course he hadn't. And... Uh, it reminds me very much of the, of the importance of the public realm as a space to meet the other, to encounter the other. And of course, in a car culture, you don't do that. You drive through in your capsule and you never really get to meet strangers in that sense. Um, uh, it reminds me a lot of the poem by Baudelaire where he describes sitting in a cafe and seeing strangers, other people with other realities, looking in at the window. Um, and I think the importance of public space as a space for that uh, is, is can't, cannot, be, cannot be underestimated in a world where increasingly we take to debate in, a, in an electronic world um, and we don't see the eyes of the stranger that flicker when we, when we make comments or, or that are not necessarily very nice. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that. And yes, uh, I guess uh, uh, public space is also play space.